Hi, my name is Khalil Cumberbatch, and I'm the Associate Vice President of Policy at the David Rothenberg Center for Public Policy at the Fortune Society, and welcome back to Both Sides of the Bars, where we continue to discuss critical questions about how the current criminal justice system works, its intersections with social justice, and highlight the efforts that are being made to improve the lives of everyone that is affected by it. We ask you, the viewers, to spread the word about Both Sides of the Bars and share your comments with us on Twitter at the Fortune SOC. Today's show is titled Hurdles to Home, and my guests today are Jeff Grant and Michelle Miles. Jeff is the Executive Director of Family Reentry Inc., a criminal justice organization with offices and programs in eight Connecticut cities. He is also the co founder of Progressive Prison Ministries. Michelle is a career advisor at the Fortune Society, and at the age of 27, after having only one involvement with the criminal justice system, she was sentenced to 30 years in federal prison for drug-related charges. Thank you, Jeff and Michelle, for joining us today. Thanks, Cliff, for having us. So, Jeff, I would love to start the conversation with you to hear a little bit more about the work that you do at your organization, but also to hear what, from your perception, both personally and professionally, what are some of the major hurdles that people face once they are exiting uh, prison? Uh, thanks, Khalil. Um, Family Reentry is a criminal justice organization based in Bridgeport, mm -hmm. but we do have programs in and offices in eight cities in um, Connecticut. We're probably the most respected criminal justice organization for programs in the state. Um, we've been around for 34 years, and two years ago I was appointed as the executive director. I'm proud to say that I'm the first person in the United States uh, formerly incarcerated for white collar crime be appointed the CEO of a major criminal justice organization. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's something I take seriously, and um, I realize that a lot of people are watching us in the criminal justice system, especially those of us who've been to prison. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we, uh, we, we deal with people with respect and dignity and care. Mm -hmm. um, Connecticut's uh, a lot like other places in the country. I mean, certainly we are more progressive than most. Same is probably true in New York in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, despite having a progressive policy in, uh, in Connecticut and leadership at the Department of Corrections under our, under our wonderful uh, commissioner, Scott Semple, mm -hmm. Connecticut has run out of money. Mm -hmm. So um, all of these reforms definitely stood still uh, while we're trying to figure that out. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's emptied the coffers of a lot of uh, social service programs, including, including criminal justice programs. So the things that we would have otherwise accomplished in terms of housing and uh, employment and uh, drug and alcohol and mental health and uh, wraparound services, um, not so much right now in the way we would like to do them. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're struggling to find other ways. Certainly we have to lean much more heavily into private fundraising. Mm -hmm. Luckily, Bridgeport is in uh, Fairfield County, one mm -hmm. of the wealthiest areas of the country. Mm -hmm. And we have uh, wonderful supporters in Greenwich and Darien and New Canaan and, and, uh, and others from the affluent communities. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's, it's difficult to make them understand uh, often that um, criminal justice issues are, um, are everybody's problem mm -hmm. for a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and that crime is everywhere and punishment is everywhere. And the more they relate to that, uh, they develop some empathy and compassion. And hopefully what it means is that we can uh, form better private-public partnerships mm -hmm. to fund um, creative, uh, forward-thinking programs that can solve some of these hurdles from, to, you know, hurdles to home. Yeah, well, thank you. And so the federal DOJ has outlined uh, underneath uh, former uh, Attorney General Eric Holder that there are approximately 45,000 uh, uh, policies, rules, regulations on the books, uh, so these illegal ways for people to be discriminated against if they have a criminal conviction. So it's 45,000 mm -hmm. legal ways um, at least. And, it is, and that is, of course, not taking into consideration the biggest uh, uh, immeasurable barrier, which is the perception, the negative perception sure. all too often mm -hmm. of who we're talking about when we do say uh, uh, people leaving prison or reentering. Mm -hmm. And so, Michelle, from your experience, both as a career advisor, but also as someone who uh, served a tremendous amount of time in federal prison, uh, can you speak to some of those, if not uh, all of those uh, 45,000 barriers, and particularly the most immeasurable one, the perception? Well, hmm. coming home, I would say that it's hard, like, 
for employment mm -hmm. and housing, especially. Mm -hmm. I did go to the halfway house from after I was released for about three weeks, mm -hmm. and from there I and went. And a halfway house is. For the, for the viewers who may not know what a halfway house is. Okay. I'm sorry. A halfway house is a place where they send you before you go back to home, which is, it's like a monitor thing. You can only go out if you have a pass. Mm -hmm. So once you enter, you cannot leave unless you have a pass to leave that place for about six, seven hours. It depends on the pass that you get. Mm -hmm. So when I went there... I wasn't really that familiar with it. So while being there, I learned that if I wanted to go out and seek employment, I had to get a pass for that. Mm -hmm. If I wanted to not even visit home, because I couldn't do that at the time. Mm -hmm. If I wanted to go shopping, I had to put in a pass. Mm -hmm. If I wanted to go to the store, I had to put in a pass. Mm -hmm. So for anything, you couldn't just go out. You had to get permission to leave. So although you're not physically in a prison, mm -hmm. you're still very much yeah. under and supervision. Yes. And the mm -hmm. halfway houses are right. locations that are in communities, right. correct? Yes, Got right it. by across the street from communities. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. <laughs> and and, and, and so you're someone, crazy. you're someone, if you could speak to as well, who received the commutation from right. pre from uh, former President Obama mm -hmm. underneath the clemency initiative that he was pushing uh, and so can you talk a little bit about that? And although you received the commutation, how you still had to very much navigate some of the barriers that you're talking right. about now. So um, in 2016, I, my sentence was commuted by Obama on May 5th. That would be very soon. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, on May 5th, 2016, I found out that I was, after one year of waiting, my sentence was commuted. Wow. So when that happened, I was very excited. But at the same time, I was in shock. Mm. And mm. I say that because I didn't really believe that it happened, even though it did, mm. because I waited for so long, you know? And when it did happen, it was like a huge weight had been lifted. Mm -hmm. So even though I received that, I still feel that I was not free. Mm -hmm. And I say that because even now I don't feel like I'm free, but mm -hmm. I'm not in prison yeah. physically. Yep. So I... um come home, I did get a job right away, mm -hmm. but I didn't keep the job. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that I was ready at the time, so by me losing the job, I felt, okay, I have to find some kind of program that can help me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when I get another job, I can keep it. Yeah. So I went to Fortune. Mm -hmm. And when I went to Fortune, I went there for employment services. I went through the employment service workshop, which is a two week workshop where they equip you to, you know, get back into the workforce, mm -hmm. however you want to say it. And <laughs> they teach you how to um, interview skills. Mm -hmm. If anybody asks you about your conviction, how to answer it, you mm -hmm. know, in the right way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to it be truthful, but don't like be so open, like to giving up a lot of information. Mm -hmm. I don't know how else to say it, but mm -hmm. I wanted to get it out there. So they equipped me with the tools to get to where I am at today. So I graduated the two-week em employment workshop. I interned there as a receptionist, and then now I've been there one year in the position that I'm in now. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. Well, congratulations. Powerful. Thank you. Yeah, and, and so so it, it, it seems that, um, that although we talked about uh, some of the barriers, it seems that one of the major ones, obviously, is access to employment. And mm -hmm. I would even add to that and say access to um, survivable employment, right? Because yeah. just having mm -hmm. a job, making a wage, doesn't mean that it's a livable sure. wage. And so what is some of the ways that your organization and Michelle, in your role, that you help folks navigate? And I would love if you can make a clear distinction between individual barriers and systemic barriers. Mm. Um, um, Employment is probably one of the one or two largest uh, mm -hmm. issues we have. And at Family Reentry, we've always taken a holistic approach because mm -hmm. getting someone a job or, um, is, um, or, or them keeping that job is impossible if they have mental health problems or they have mm -hmm. substance abuse problems. Mm -hmm. And so um, w we look at an approach where we're, we're actually trying to help them reenter mm -hmm. and become a, um, an effective and successful member of, of, of society. Mm -hmm. um, not an easy thing to do, especially since um, um, there's not a lot of employers out there that are willing to take a risk mm -hmm. on, um, on uh, formerly incarcerated people. Mm -hmm. Although I'd say in some ways that's changed. Mm -hmm. Now maybe it's because um, 
there's 4% uh, unemployment mm. and uh, they have no choice but to take some risks or what they consider to be risks mm -hmm. that they wouldn't have otherwise taken. Mm -hmm. But um, I would say that for the most part, um, we are looking for entry level jobs for people because mm -hmm. it gets their, their foot in the door. Mm -hmm. And some have been very successful. I mean, uh, we hire, Family Reentry hires formerly incarcerated people. Mm -hmm. And at one point, fully 35 or 40% of our workforce that mm -hmm. worked in our, in, our, in our agency were formerly incarcerated people. Mm -hmm. But even now, um, for example, I'm formerly incarcerated, um, head of firm, our director of uh, community affairs, Fred Hodges, mm -hmm. uh, who's with me today, mm -hmm. by the way, yeah. he, um, he is the, um, um, the highest ranking nonprofit um, executive in the state of Connecticut who has actually gone through the Connecticut uh, penal system. Mm. So we take a lot of pride in that. Yep. And by modeling that, yep. we get to show the, um, the business community and also the, the rest of the, the uh, ecosystem, whether it be um, donors or government or whoever, mm -hmm. that um, we can be responsible people who can, um, who can um, 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 have um, employment at higher levels. Mm -hmm. And obviously, w one of the things we want to do is raise the ceiling yep. because and, and raise the floor. Yep. The ceiling, so there's a few of us. You're mm -hmm. one of those people who, mm -hmm. who can be a role model. Mm -hmm. um, the floor, a little bit harder mm -hmm. because um, we're putting people, you know, in entry-level positions. Mm -hmm. And if they can't feed themselves or their families, yeah. then, then it's a problem. And a lot of people don't understand, for example, the fe federal uh, tax subsidy um, programs mm -hmm. or Connecticut has something called Step Up where we actually subsidize people in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. um, those programs were great, except that no, very few people took advantage of them. Mm -hmm. They didn't know about it. They weren't poorly um, promoted. Mm -hmm. They were poorly promoted. So um, we're battling that all the time. Yeah. And I, I think that the answer has to be more than just simply career fairs. Mm -hmm. I think career fairs are great, mm -hmm. but, but still wha what we need is the opportunity to go into large scale employers, yeah. employers that, have, that, that employ tens of thousands of people and penetrate that and so that we can have uh, the systemic change throughout the country and, mm -hmm. we can, and we're trying to be a leader in that. Yeah, well thank you for that work and thank mm -hmm. you for making that distinction. Thanks. So Michelle, I would love for you um, to you know, talk about your uh, re-entry experience uh, okay. from, uh, from the lens of a uh, woman, uh, particularly a woman mm -hmm. of color. As we know, women in general, but particularly women of color, are the, uh, the, the uh, fastest growing a population of people who are entering into prisons and jails, mm -hmm. and obviously that's alarming for many reasons. Um, but also that means that a, a, a large majority of them are also re-entering at a much right. more uh, uh, rapid pace. And so I would love to kind of hear from your perspective, you know, what were some of the major barriers that were unique to women, but particularly women of color, um, who are exiting federal prison? Uh, because there is a distinction to make between state facilities and federal facilities. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. so as I said, for me, um, getting a job merely probably not even a month after being out of prison, I didn't keep the job. And I was fired by another employee, not mm -hmm. even a HR person, a manager, or anything like that. So I didn't really understand, even though there's some story behind that, can't say it now, but, um, when I was terminated, I felt like, what did I do? I know I didn't, I cried. Mm -hmm. I said, I didn't do anything, but why did they terminate me? Mm -hmm. So after going to Fortune, and I, like I said, graduated the workshop, I felt that I wasn't ready to go out. So I said, like, is there any program that I can do that would help me, mm -hmm. better equip me for going back into the workforce and keeping my job? Because mm -hmm. I don't want to be unemployed. Yeah. So I was told that I can do the transitional work program, mm -hmm. which is a program for people like myself that either you've been paroled or you have done a lot of time and you've been out of the workforce. Mm -hmm. So when I went through that, I, re I interned as a receptionist and it better equipped me for mm -hmm. now. Yeah. So I've had my job now for one year, which mm -hmm. is great. I've been promoted. Mm -hmm. I even received a raise. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. And <laughs> I'm keeping my job. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and so yeah. there mm -hmm. are many women who leave uh, uh, facilities and are re-entering that have children, uh, right. particularly in the federal system. We're seeing more and more women who left children at a very young age mm -hmm. and unfortunately serve tremendous amounts of time and come back. And those children are entering into early adulthood. And so 
from your experience working with women who have children and trying to create or nurture those bonds again, can you talk about some of the unique barriers that that presents? Um, because you know, one would argue and say that that's not, uh, uh, employment is one major pressing uh, issue that needs to be addressed, but also family reunification is another Right, key because piece. it's hard, and I can speak on, like, I don't have children, mm -hmm. but I can say I've known people to, that did, mm -hmm. and to get that relationship back with their children, it is hard, just like mm -hmm. for me, with my family, still to this day, I don't feel like I know them, like they're not the same people mm -hmm. that I left when mm -hmm. I went away 20 years ago. Yeah. they my family, but do they really know me? Do I really know them? Yeah. I don't feel like that. Yeah. So I'm still today trying to build. Like yeah. I know people who still don't have that relationship with their children. They want that relationship with their children, but it's just not there. Yeah, mm. yeah. And so what would, you, what would you offer as a suggestion for someone who is trying to navigate that as a, as, as a hurdle to kind of reenter successfully, uh, which is a hurdle I feel all too often is not mm -hmm. talked about, right? Mm -hmm. Like we talk a lot about employment and housing for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. Uh, because they're needed to stabilize a person, but then you know, family bonds are something that's also needed to give someone longevity in reentry. It is. So I would say that you continue to try to build that bond, and it's not. Don't force it. Mm -hmm. You know, just let it happen naturally. Is basically what I could say. Because I still, like I said, even though I see my sisters like almost three or four times a week. Mm -hmm. You know, like from Friday to Sunday, I see them you know, for about eight hours a day because I'm with them. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I have other family that I'm very close with, but, well, I was, that's mm -hmm. how I felt. And now I feel like we like this mm -hmm. since I've came home. Yeah. And it's sad because these, like, my first cousins, yeah. my mother's sister's children, we all grew up together. Mm -hmm. And when I felt that we was this, now we this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I've been trying to build, but it seemed like the more I try, it goes this way mm -hmm. instead of this way. Yeah, yeah. Sure. So I kind of backed off and I'm going to let it, if it's supposed to be this, then it's going to come back to mm -hmm. that. Yeah. yeah. So that's, I don't know how else to put it. Yeah, yeah. well, thank you. And, and mm -hmm. so Jeff, how, you know, working with the folks that you work with and that you service, uh, helping them to kind of make some of these mm -hmm. connections, you know, what is, like, what is a, a method that you use uh, to help the people that you service to kind of re re uh, reestablish those ties and we've heard from Michelle obviously about mothers but also for fathers right mm -hmm. there's an estimated 2.7 million children in this country mm -hmm. who have a uh, who identifies having at least mm -hmm. one parent who is incarcerated mm -hmm. and so how do you help folks to kind of navigate that well again that's a really hard thing I yeah. mean it, um, it's uh, it's personal mm -hmm. and there's a lot of trauma and there's a lot of shame and mm -hmm. guilt involved in all of this especially mm -hmm. when it comes to uh, leaving children behind. I was no different, mm -hmm. so uh, it was, uh, it was a, it's a, f a family tragedy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the advice I give people when they come back from prison is that if, if you're like hyper-focused on a career, hyper-focused on a job, you're kind of missing the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Because there's a spiritual moment, there's mm -hmm. a transformative moment mm -hmm. that everyone I know who've been to prison have gone through, and yeah. mostly for the good. Yeah. Some, not everybody, but mm -hmm. mostly for the good. So when I came back from prison, what I decided I was going to do is I was going to volunteer. Mm. And because I wasn't going to get a job of my dreams when I got back, yeah. but through volunteerism, I was able to get to places where I wouldn't otherwise have gone, mm -hmm. uh, uh, gotten to. And also, I got to prove myself. Mm. So after volunteering for a couple of years, I decided I would um, apply to seminary. Mm -hmm. And I applied to Union Theological Seminary right here in, um, in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And I went there for three years and wow. I got a Master of Divinity mm -hmm. and I came out and I started to work as an associate pastor in an inner city church in Bridgeport. Mm -hmm. Now, that was not on my trajectory. <laughs> it's like I didn't, you know, it's like, I, w you know, I mean, I, I, w I was a Jewish lawyer <laughs> in, in Manhattan yeah. and then I moved to being a, a, a Baptist minister mm -hmm. in inner city Bridgeport. Yeah. And there, there's no like direct route for that. You know, yeah. just have to kind of follow where God leads. Yep. And, but through that experience, what happened was that I, I, I was able to find myself and find my inner, uh, my inner authenticity. Mm -hmm. And that's what I tell people. I mean, you, you have an opportunity to reinvent yourself. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you, if you think you're gonna reinvent yourself by, by um, not volunteering or not being faithful or not doing those things, mm -hmm. 
you know, you're a guy who's going to have a, uh, an entry level job at Popeyes or something. Yeah, yeah. But uh, you re this is an opportunity to throw yourself into your passion mm -hmm. and decide who you really want to be. Every person I know, every single person I know who's done that, their life goes in a direction that they would never have planned, mm. but things make way that, that are beyond their wildest dreams. Mm -hmm. And that's also true with children. Um, yeah. As Michelle said, I mean, you can't force yourself back into, into children. You can't yeah. force yourself back into family. But somehow, by being someone who is um, trustworthy and, and, um, and forthright and authentic, mm -hmm. things happen their own way. And, um, and, uh, and I, think that I think it's very, uh, very you know, wise of her to say that. Yeah. And so, you know, you both sit here, right? It's, it's very, very, very exceptional stories. Um, and I myself have a very exceptional story. Yeah. And one of the things that I'm uh, always very, very conscious of is how we uh, remove ourselves from being called exceptional, but acknowledging opportunities that we've received. And so obviously going to you know, uh, uh, union uh, 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 seminary is, is one thing, getting a commutation from President Obama sure. is another. And so what would you say to someone who is listening or looking at this show right now who uh, doesn't ha has has not had uh, access to those uh, um, exceptional opportunities. Um, what would you say to that person who is facing very much the same struggles that all of us uh, have faced when re-entering, um, and just quite honestly feeling like it's not going to happen, and that they do want to do something that might put them at risk from re-entering mm -hmm. into the criminal justice system? I would say to never give up because I know that it was very hard for me. And although I didn't see that light at the end of the tunnel at the time, I just knew that one day I wouldn't be walking out them prison doors. I just didn't know it was going to be when I did. But I would say never give up because yeah. it's possible. If it happened for me, it could happen for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Look, um, I recognize that I always have to put my, my privilege, my white male privilege on the table. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about it that things happen in this society, in this country, on, you know, for... Um, for people of privilege. Mm -hmm. But my reality was that um, my family had no money. Mm -hmm. And so when I, I never even considered for a, sec for a second that I wasn't going to go to college. Mm. I just went to college yeah. and I paid for it myself and I worked full time and I went to college. And then when it was time to decide to become a lawyer, I had to do that. And I worked full time and I became a lawyer. And I don't know that that's different than anybody else who decides what they want to do mm -hmm. is devote their life to something more, higher, better. I don't think I have an exceptional story, mm -hmm. but I do think I do think that what I'd like to be is a power of example mm -hmm. for, for people that you don't have to be limited by what you think your your personal situation is. Mm -hmm. You can actually do in this world what you some at least some of the things that you want to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so lastly, you know, we have a few more minutes left. Um, you know, there has been uh, a, a slowly growing trend across the country um, that says that we are slowly ending mass incarceration. That the number of 2.3 million, the number that's used to describe mass incarceration in this country, that that number is on a downward spiral, slowly but surely. There are some states that are reporting low, the lowest levels of crime in conjunction with the lowest levels of incarcerated populations. And so cities are doing the same. And so there are a lot of elected officials, politicians, stakeholders, advocates that would, that would love to uh, acknowledge that as a symbol that mass incarceration is at an end. Um, however, we all work at organizations that are right at literally, in, in, in many examples, at the door when people walk through. And so what would you say to that? Someone says, Jeff, Michelle, I hear you, but we're fixing the problem. Mass incarceration is almost at an end. What would you say to those people? Well, it's, it's not true. Definitely. It's not true. And every bed in every prison in this country is full. Mm. And if they're not, if they're not carrying either um, state or federal um, prison numbers than their immigration detainees mm -hmm. that are just prisoners in another, you know, in, a, in another suit. Mm -hmm. And, and um, so we're actually imprisoning in this country more people now mm -hmm. than we ever have. Yeah. And so it's, it's a, it's, it's just a little bit of a shell game. Yeah. And 
I, and I, I was in a prison with uh, half the population were immigration detainees. Mm. And, what ha and at the end of sentence, at the end of sentence, they go out into the, into the lobby, they're re-handcuffed mm. the re uh, by, by ICE mm -hmm. uh, and, and by immigration authorities. Mm -hmm. They're re-arrested, they're given a new, um, a, a new number, mm -hmm. an A series number yep. as immigration detainees, and they're put back to the same bed they just left them. Yeah. They left, but they're no longer considered Bureau of Prisons prisoners. Wow. So it's just, it, the, 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 the harsh reality is much different than, than what people would lead, mm. lead you to believe. Yeah. Thank you. Michelle? Right, and um, as he was saying, but I'm going to say something a little bit different. Until they make the laws fair, and when I say fair from both sides, like you could commit a crime today, and someone could be in prison that committed the same crime you committed, mm. and you would get a lesser sentence than the person that's in prison. And whatever law that's in effect right now mm -hmm. won't affect the person that's in prison that committed that same crime. So yeah. until they make it fair on both sides or retroactive, yeah. however you want to say it, we still gonna have that mass incarceration because while you feel like, okay, this person is coming in, but he's not gonna get that much time, you still got people sitting in prison that did the same thing and they can't even get out. So. Mm -hmm. That's not in the mass incarceration mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at all. Amen yeah. to that. Yeah, yeah. thank mm -hmm. you. And so in 30 seconds, uh, I wanted to talk very briefly about your book, your memoir that you penned uh, about your story. In 2013, I wrote a short memoir. It's about seven chapters, a uh, slight story of my childhood mm -hmm. into me getting into trouble. And I was not out of prison when I wrote that book, so it doesn't tell that part. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it does give a general idea of how I grew up as a child and to when I got arrested. Got it. And what's mm -hmm. the name of the memoir? The High Price I Had to Pay Two. Okay. Awesome. The, the number nice. two. Nice. Got it. Yeah. Well, thank you both for joining um, and sharing your story and your expertise and your analysis. Um, and thank you, Jeff, from co for coming all the way from Connecticut. Yeah. <laughs> We've got to drive back now. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So thank you, viewers, uh, for tuning in. Uh, if you're interested in finding out more about the Fortune Society, please check us out on the web at fortunesociety.org or on Facebook by typing in The Fortune Society. My name is Khalil Cumberbatch, and I appreciate you joining us as we continue to critically look at both sides of the bars.